Okay, so my name is John Layton, as you can see here. Um, I have a green laser. I was, when I was a child, I was quite infatuated by lasers, so this is quite exciting for me. Um, I'm a Rails core developer, uh, but a year ago, I wasn't a Rails core developer. Uh, in fact, I had maybe uh, one commit against Rails that was several years prior to that. But about a year ago from now, I decided that um, I really wanted to contribute to Rails, and so I, decided, I did the classic open source thing, and I decided to scratch an itch. So, <coughs> oh no, Josh. <laughs> Why does it not work? <laughs> okay, I don't care about this screen. We, if we can make it work on. Sorry. So while he's doing that, so I decided to scratch an itch, and um, we've probably all seen uh, through associations, I'm sure, in, in Rails. But in in Rails three, what you can't do is you can't have a. a through association that goes through another through association. So essentially multiple joins in, in one query. You can't do that in Rails 3. And this was something that in uh, previous projects I'd quite wanted to be able to do and it annoyed me that it didn't work. Thanks, Josh. Um, <laughs> I love this man. <laughs> um, it, so it annoyed me and so I just thought, okay, I'm gonna implement this. This is gonna be the thing I do. So, so yeah, so this is a normal through association. We've all seen this. And then this is an example of what doesn't work in Rails 3. So it goes through the tasks association and tasks there you can see already goes through something else. So um, I wasn't the first person to think about this. This you probably can't really see, but this is a screenshot of the Rails track bug tracker. Uh, and the circle is where it says 2006. That was the first time somebody tried to implement this feature. And that kind of went round, you know, uh, some people developed a plugin. Uh, there's a screenshot of the plugin. Uh, unfortunately, though, it kind of, uh, the plugin broke on every Rails release because it was really kind of intertwined with the um, associations code in Rails. And, and when that changed, it, it messed up the plugin. And there were some edge cases that weren't dealt with, it wasn't fully tested, etc. So it wasn't a perfect solution. But I kind of knew that I, you know, maybe this wasn't, it wasn't totally simple, it wasn't a two-line fix, and I needed to think about it, and, you know, it, it, it was a, a fairly big task to, to deal with. So, with that in mind, I just want to uh, present an example of um, the kind of crux of the problem. So, here we have a task model, and the task has many comments. This is just a regular comments association. There's also a project model and project has many tasks, and there's an account model, and account has many projects. And so on top of that, here is a regular through association, so account has many tasks through projects. And the arrow in green uh, is what we call the source association, so it's like the source of the through association. The arrow in kind of ready, muddy, uh, brown color is the through association. So it's going through projects, but the source is tasks. This, remember that because it's important in a minute. <clears throat> so this is a regular through association. And as I say, what you can't do in uh, Rails 3 is, is this. So uh, account now has a comment association that goes through tasks. But of course, tasks is already a through association. Um, so here's another example. We're using the same set of models. Project has many comments through tasks. And then account has many comments through projects. But again, this is a, a nested through association because uh, this time the source association comments uh, in, in the middle here is actually a through association again. So let's look at those two, two side by side. And uh, highlighted in red is the comments association on account. And the thing to note here is that they're, basic, they're, they're the same association, but it, it's two slightly different data structures that actually represent exactly the same set of records. So I kind of mused about this for a while and wasn't really sure what to do. Uh, and I was aware that some of the complexity of the um, previous patches and plugins that I, I mentioned earlier had come from the fact that they were trying to um, reconcile this, this complexity and, and it sort of involved lots of recursion and stuff like that. And, so 
What I did is I, I thought about the actual SQL that would be generated in the end. Uh, and in both cases, it's, it's exactly the same. So it's select all from comments, in a join tasks, in a join projects, where the account ID is whatever. So the thing to note here is it, it's, it's linear. It's just it's a list of things that are, are getting joined together. But the actual data structure we had was more complex. So I thought I kind of need to transform this data structure into something else that I'll be more easily able to, to generate this SQL from. Uh, and so I used recursion. So uh, basically, it, it goes left to right. So this is essentially a tree data structure. Uh, and what I really want to get at is comments, pro tasks, projects, uh, which are basically the leaves of the tree. And so through recursion, uh, first go into the source association and get to a leaf immediately, so stop there and come back up to comments on account, go into uh, tasks on account, but that's a through association, so I have to recur further to tasks on project, and that's a leaf, so back up to tasks on account, and then into projects on account. So select all comments, inner join tasks, inner join projects. And again with the other example. <coughs> First into the source association to comments on project, then to comments on task, and stop there, back up to comments on project, into tasks on project, back up to comments on project, back up to comments on account, and into projects on account. This is exactly the same list, obviously. Comments, tasks, projects, select all comments, inner join tasks, inner join projects. So the great thing here is that I now had a data structure that I could work with. And even though these, the initial specification of the associations was different, I was then able to transform that into a data structure that was the same and to then generate the, the same SQL. So kind of the lesson here is if you have a complex problem, sometimes it can really help to think hard about the data structures that you're using. And sometimes the initial, the raw data that you have available to you isn't appropriate. And uh, it, it can be really beneficial to transform that data into something that you can work more easily with. So in this example, the, the recursion that I needed to do uh, was sort of minimized to just that area where I was generating the data structure. And after that, it was merely iteration, which is a lot, you know, a lot more simple to program. <coughs> so let's look at the code to actually do that. Um, this is uh, a class in Active Record is Association Reflection. And this basically holds metadata about associations. So if you have a tasks association on uh, a comment model, or sorry, a comments association on task model, then uh, on that task model, there'll be this object, the reflection of that association that holds uh, any like conditions and the, what the foreign key names are, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a good place to put this method. And I decided to call it chain. Uh, <coughs> and so, it, it's, it's quite simply the algorithm that I, I've shown before. If it's a, th a through association, then take the chain from the source reflection, add it to the chain from the through reflection, and it, eventually we're going to get to something that's not a through association. And in that case, we just return a one item array uh, of self. So that's all well and good. Um, <clears throat> but the thing to note here is what we're really saying in this code is well, if we have one type of thing, then do something. And if we've got some other type of thing, then do something else. Well, we actually have language tools for this. Um, so it, another way of, of doing it is to have a through reflection subclass of association reflection for that specific type of reflection. And then we don't actually need any logic in, in the chain method at all. We can define the through reflection version of the chain method like, like so. And then the, uh, the general association reflection class uh, just has the standard chain method, like so. So the second lesson uh, that I, I want to point out is always think about using polymorphism. And you know, of course, we've all heard of polymorphism, and it's great. But try to think about when you're coding, are you sort of, sometimes it's not immediately obvious, but are you doing different things depending on the different types of things that you're dealing with. And if you are, then it can be really helpful to, to create subject, separate objects for that, because it actually reduces the complexity of your code. 
And instead of that if statement that we had before, that, that logic was then uh, sort of represented by the types of objects that we were dealing with. And so we're then able to uh, lean on the method dispatch uh, in Ruby, which makes the code much nicer and cleaner. So <coughs> I worked out, you can't, oh, you can't really see this picture, but you can see my eyes glinting. Um, I, I, I worked out my general algorithm for how I was going to attack this problem, and I spent some time working on it. It was actually, it took quite a long time. I, I spent about two weeks doing it. I, I was in between uh, some freelance contracts at the time, so I got really focused, and my girlfriend started to wonder whether I'd gone insane because I didn't leave the house for days at a time, and uh, I wrote tons of tests, and there were Lots of edge cases to deal with, like uh, single table inheritance and polymorphic associations and all that. So, and while I was doing it, I was, um, <clears throat> I was also finding that it was quite difficult to work with the code that was already in Active Record. And uh, one of the reasons it was difficult was because the associations code in Active Record in, in Rails 3 hadn't um, been refactored to use Errol. Um, you might have heard of Errol, it's like a data structure for representing SQL queries. So, and so, I was obviously, I was a bit disappointed about this. Um, <clears throat> but, I would say that the associations code in Rails had suffered from what I call duct tape development. And this is where your developer comes along and, and finds a bug and wants to fix it. And so, developer goes in and finds a line of code that needs changing or a few lines of code, writes a test, fixes it, gets the hell out of there. And that's great when you need to fix a bug, but the problem is that it, it's like people slapping bits of duct tape on the side of the thing, and we all know that eventually duct tape can fail, and, and, and things fall off the ceiling or, or whatever. Uh, and so the code had suffered from, from this approach, and nobody was really taking a wider view of the code base, and uh, uh, taking that big picture, and so it was actually quite complex when you needed to change things that touched lots of different parts of that, that area of the code. So I don't like to give up on things, so I just got back and, and decided that I was going to um, refactor the associations code. And so I, I sort of went quite systematically through Lighthouse, it was using Lighthouse at the time. Uh, I found all the bug reports to do with associations, and I, I went through and categorized them all and made a note to look at them all, and decided to to really try and clean it up. And I went through every file that was related to associations, and you know, a lot of it was just standard stuff, but I, I want to give some examples of other things that I did. So <clears throat> one thing was to do with the, the association proxy. And this is the part of Rails that allows you to do, do things like this. So task.comments.count, where comments is an association. And this, this doesn't send a count method to an array of comments. This, sends some SQL to the database and, and returns the result of that count query. But on the other hand, uh, this example will actually load up the comments from the database and then call map on the, that comments array. So how does this work? Well, method missing. So this is not exactly how it looks, but it, you can see more or less uh, basically the count method would be defined on the proxy object. And so if we call that, then it just hits that method and we, we do the special uh, thing that we need to do for count. But in all other cases, we hit method missing and then load up the, the target records of that association and then just call that method on those records. So load target looks something like this. Uh, basically getting a, a scope, a relation object, and then calling to a, a on it, which uh, generates the SQL, sends it to the database, and loads it up. But unfortunately, I've made a typo here. Um, so what happens? Well, it hits method missing, which loads the target, which hits method missing, which loads the target, which hits method missing, and it carries on like that. Uh, doesn't stop, ever. Uh, and so this is a problem. And it's not a problem if you're just using Rails because hopefully the code actually works, but if you're developing on it, I, I, I encountered this repeatedly. And what it was, was really an indication that that object was doing too much. That object was simultaneously trying to be a proxy object, and it was also trying to know about how to generate a scope and generate the SQL in order to actually load that association. So I just split it up into two objects. So there's 
now an association object that knows how, how to load up the records, and there's a proxy object, which is very small, which really only handles catching method missing, and everything else is delegated to the association object. The great thing about this is that uh, when we get into that previous situation, if I made a typo in low target, then it wouldn't hit method missing because method missing isn't defined on that association object. So this is an example of the single responsibility principle. You've probably heard of the single responsibility principle, and you know it's, it's a fairly core piece of object-oriented uh, design, you know, a fairly core piece of object-oriented design pattern. And um, the thing is, if I had a, a penny or a hrivna for every time I saw somebody who had violated the single responsibility principle, I, would, I wouldn't be rich, but I would be more well off than I am now. The thing is that objects, when, when we work on them, things grow and objects develop responsibilities that they didn't have in the first place. And so it's really important to continue to be vigilant about objects that violate the single responsibility principle and, and, and constantly ask yourself, is this object doing too much and can it be split up? And that, of course, makes it much easier to maintain as well. So another area of the associations code is the preloader. The preloader is the part of the code that allows us to do queries like this. So this is um, <coughs> task.include comments. So when we load up all the tasks, we also load up all the comments associated with those tasks. And that means that if we iterate over the tasks, then we don't have to send a query for every single task to the database to get the comments. So here's an example of that in action. Firstly, we select all tasks. And there are two tasks, one and two. And then we select all comments where the task ID is either one or two. And there are four comments that come back. And then the preloader has to link up those tasks with those comments. So the way that this is implemented is in, in Rails 3 is actually a module, which is then included into Active Record Base. And that module contains a number of methods. This is a, actually a diagram of um, those methods, and each blob in the diagram represents a single method. Each arrow in the diagram represents a method calling another method. And actually, the blob at the top is the only method in the preloader code which is called by any other part of the Rails code base. And that method, as you can see, then calls one of four other methods, a, a method for has one, a, ha a method for has many, a method for has and belongs to many, and a method for belongs to. And then subsequently, those methods all call various other methods, which are basically shared code between those four methods. So I didn't really like this, in particular because a lot of the methods were quite long, and a lot of the methods had crazy names. They all started with the word preload. And so I refactored it into a number of discrete objects. So this is a, an example of the class hierarchy of the objects that I refactored it into. And so the starting point of the hierarchy is this association object, which is then able to contain all of that shared code that was down at the bottom of the previous diagram. And there was actually some, in the original code, there was some duplication between uh, collection uh, associations, like has many and has and belongs to many, and singular associations, like belongs to and has one. And so I created another level, a, a collection abstract class and a singular abstract class, and then we get into the actual the types, has many, has and belongs to many, has one, belongs to, etc. So there's a name for this sort of refactoring. Um, <clears throat> I thought it up myself. It's called object-oriented programming. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it was a massive module containing some massive methods that weren't anything to do with active record base. It, it was something that needed to be on its own. So it's important to be vigilant about this. So I'd like to just uh, <coughs> have a little thought experiment. Here is uh, an arbitrary method. It doesn't really matter what it does. Um, it, it takes in a parameter code, and it calls clean up and colorize on, on that code. And here's another way of writing that exact same thing a, as an object that takes in uh, code to the initializer, stores it in an instance variable, and then has an output method that actually does that work. Now, this is just clearly a silly example, and the previous, previous method is obviously better. 
But my point here is that there's, I don't like it when I hear people say, this method needs to be this long. It has to be 30 or 50 lines long because it's, it's just complicated. It, like, it never has to be. There, there, there's no inherent reason why the work that happens in a method has to, has to be a method like that and, and can't be another object. It's just a case of working out how to split it up. So with that in mind, I'd like to present the smells of object extraction. <clears throat> so there are three smells. The first one is long method names. So method names are basically, inside the method, we have to do some work. And the method name is how we name that work. And so if the method name is actually quite long, then it means that we really have to provide a lot of context to describe the work that that method is doing. So the thing I wonder when I see methods with long method names is why is that context not provided by the object that we're actually calling the method on? <coughs> so from the preloader code, again, we have this method preload has many association. And really, the first part is a namespace. Preload is a namespace. And the second part, has many, is a subclass. It's a, a subcategory of the work that that preloader um, code needs to do. And so when I refactored it, it just became the preloader namespace and a has many subclass. And, and then the method after that was just three lines long. It was just run. So the second smell of object extraction is having many or repeated parameters. So parameters to methods are the state that we have to pass in to allow that work to happen. And if you have to pass in lots of uh, parameters, or if you have multiple methods that all have the same parameters that they take, then again, I wonder why, why is that state being passed into the method every time? Why, why can't it be stored on the object? Is it because that state is not actually to do with the object that the method is defined on? And should it be in a separate object? Again, in the preloader code, or in, in that big module with all those methods, there were eight methods with a records parameter. There were seven methods with a reflection parameter. There were six with a preload options parameter. And there were three with a reflection name parameter. Well, when I did the refactoring, all of these things just became state on the objects. And so I no longer needed to pass them around. And so that obviously made the code a lot cleaner because there was less noise in the method definitions themselves. So the third smell of object extraction is long methods with lots of variables. So local variables in a method are what we do when we're working towards the, the problem that the method is actually trying to solve. And so if you're assigning lots of local variables, then you have to do a lot of work before you get to the kind of the final answer of the method. And so when I see this, I think to myself, why can't these local variables be methods on the object itself? And sometimes the answer is because these local variables are only relevant to the work that's happening in this method. And so there, to me, the clear answer is that the work that's happening in this method needs to be on its own object. And in that case, we can take those local variables and make the method definitions. And so the, the actual method then becomes a lot more focused on the, the crux of what it's trying to achieve. And so it makes the code a lot easier to read. So this is an example from the original preload code. And don't try to read it. It's, it's quite small. But highlighted in red are uh, examples of local variables. And out of 15 lines of code, this method is actually only doing two lines that are not to do with populating local variables. So when I did the refactoring into separate, separate objects, all of these local variables were able to be their own methods with their own names, et cetera, et cetera. So the methods became a lot more focused and easier to test and easier to follow. So I want you to ask yourself, when you, when you look at a, a method that is not trivial, you know, more than 10 lines of code, say, more than five lines, I want you to just, rather than asking, rather, rather than trying to make excuses about why it can't be refactored, why it has to be like this, just please ask yourself, why shouldn't I refactor it into a separate object? And sometimes there are valid reasons, but sometimes there aren't. So I think everyone could benefit from being more critical about this. So <clears throat> I finally got my patch in, in on the 22nd of March, 2011. I was very happy. It took me six months. Uh, and I, I think the results are fairly good in, 
in that this is the, the code count of the patch before I did all the refactoring work. And so it was adding 877 lines, taking away 535. And so there was a net result of, of 342 lines of code added. And after that refactoring, that went down to just 94 lines of code. And so the patch was a lot more focused on the actual problem I was trying to solve. And it was much easier for the developers to merge it because I wasn't having to fight against all this messy code. And I was able to just really go in and implement the actual feature and, and, and do that quite succinctly. So I think that really helped to get the patch in. <clears throat> so now I just have some closing thoughts. One is that I am a big fan of refactoring. I think everyone should refactor you know, as, as part of their day-to-day -day lives. And I think it's a really great opportunity to learn from the mistakes of others. Y you can't expect to write good code if you haven't really studied where code went wrong. And so I think refactoring is a fantastic opportunity to really think hard about code, think about why it didn't work, think about how to make it better. And then when you come to write your own code in the future, you won't make those mistakes. Secondly, consider the whole code base. A lot of us probably work on a day-to-day -day basis by you know, going to a bug tracker, picking off a bug or a feature, and then we want to just get in there and implement it and then get out of there. And that's great. Uh, and you know, we need to do that. But it's really important to also make time to just consider the whole code base and not consider just with a view to getting something in particular done, but think about the overall coherency of your code base. And thirdly, well, I want to ask a question. Who, who here has heard of polymorphism? He heard it? Who knows about polymorphism? OK, a lot of people know about polymorphism. Who's heard of the single responsibility principle? OK, right. Everyone's heard of it, right? The thing is, I was the one who did these refactorings, and, and nobody else did. And <laughs> I, so go me, right? But my point is that like, you have to repeatedly ask questions about your code. It's not like there's lots of patterns that you can apply. And after I show it, it's really obvious. Oh, he used polymorphism. He used single responsibility principle, etc. And it's kind of obvious. But a lot of the time, these things don't get changed. And so it's really about taking this, this set of patterns that we all know and just questioning your code. So I want to present this slide again because just you know, I see methods that are really long all the time. So for, for my sanity, please uh, <laughs> uh, think about this. And that's me. Thank you very much. So can I just make a request? I will take three questions, because I know Vlad's keen, keen to, to get on. And uh, if you're asking a question, you only get one question. And, and keep it short, less than 30 seconds. Um, so I have a question. You're talking about good object-oriented design and so on. And I have just checked Active Record, and it has like a few dozens of modules included in Active Record base instead of full objects. What do you think about that? Uh, I want to change that, yes. Um, it's, if anyone here wants to pay me loads of money to uh, refactor Rails all, all day, every day, then come talk to me after. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I know I agree with you. Um, Act, Act, Active Record has some uh, definite code smells at the moment, and that's definitely something that's on my agenda in the future. Can you please tell a little bit about your experience with uh, your patches being uh, accepted? How long did it take? Did it take too much to communicate with uh, the core team? Sorry, I can't, I can't um, hear very well from the stage. Right, a little bit about your uh, own experience with your patches being submitted, with being accepted, sorry. Did it take long? Did you have to communicate a lot with the core team? So um, the patch itself, uh, well, it, it took me about six months from when I started it until when it finally got in. But in between then, uh, I was making quite a lot of commits to Active Record in order to do these refactorings that eventually led to that patch uh, being able to go in itself. So, so yeah, it did take a long time. Um, and 
it, it was a case of, you know, gradually... The thing was, because I wrote this patch and it was hundreds of lines of code long and nobody on the Rails core team really knew who I was. And so I just chucked this huge patch at them and said, hey guys, merge me. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of see this from, from my perspective now that I, I merge other people's patches and it actually takes a lot of time to review code. And so if somebody completely unknown throws hundreds of lines of code at me, then it's, you know, it, it's probably going to take me half a day or a day to sit down and review their code and I might not have half a day or a day. So. My experience from that is it was really useful to do these refactorings because I was making smaller commits that were easier to review and, and helped uh, me to become more familiar to the core team at the time. And therefore, when I you know, finished all that refactoring and wanted to get my patch in, it, it was easier to do. Okay, last question. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, at least once a month, uh, one person is confused around me uh, with the problem that uh, calling a class in a uh, uh, result of has many association returns an array, but it's not an array. And uh, does this behavior going to change or how, do, why does the core team did the decision to make it return an array and don't tell people that it is not an array and it doesn't actually load the results and they can call scopes on that and so on and so on. Okay, so, so you're saying, it's a, it's a cause of confusion that the proxy object is not a, a, a normal array. It's yeah, sort of it, a special it's array. It, more, it can act as scope. Mm. Uh, it can handle sco uh, additional scopes and so on and so on. And to explain this to people that when they, uh, it, they see that it's an array, it's hard. I mean, I, I think it's, it's quite a fundamental feature of active records. So I don't see that changing. Um, I recognize that it, it could be quite confusing for newbies, but I think the solution there is um, explaining to them and, and documentation. So if you, if you like to contribute to the docs, then please do. <laughs> I like to contribute to the core. Okay, thank you everyone, and um, if I look bored later, come and talk to me. <laughs>